Hello, my name is Jenny Cotton. I'm a practicing dermatopathologist at St. Joseph Mercy Hospital in Ann Arbor, Mich Michigan. Today I'm very honored to speak with Dr. Leonard Sperling, Professor of Dermatology and Pathology, Uniform Services University in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, Dr. Sperling is a renowned expert in the field of hair pathology, an area I think that still confounds and confuses many practicing dermatopathologists, including myself. So welcome, Dr. Sperling. Thank you very much. I'd like to start by asking you how you developed your interest in hair pathology and perhaps mention some of the mentors that, that led you into that area and who furthered your education in that area. Sure. Um, in 1987, I was a dermatologist at Walter Reed Army Medical Center, uh, responsible for teaching the residents who would come to me with hair loss patients. And I was tired of feeling ignorant <laughs> uh, because I didn't think that I really had the, the knowledge to help them. So I decided to solve that problem by uh, reading everything I possibly could about the, the subject. It turns out there wasn't all that much out there that was helpful. But there was um, one article by Dr. Heddington, one of my mentors, who uh, in 1984 first talked about using transfer sections to evaluate the pathology of hair loss. So that captivated me because our biopsies were not that helpful, um, the routinely vertically sectioned biopsies. So I began playing with that. And from that, I learned more about hair anatomy. And uh, I also found I was now better able to help the patients and, and teach the residents better. And it just kind of took off from there. My real mentor, I would say, as, as I was starting off, was um, Dr. David Whiting, who's mm -hmm. another uh, real pioneer in hair pathology in this, in this country. But there, there were other um, you know, great people who helped me along, Dr. Uh, Vera Price mm -hmm. and Wilma Burkfeld, of course. And, you know, some of the, the greats in, in clinical medicine. Very good. So you were able to, t to spend time in the clinic with patients, it sounds, as well, it sounds like, as well, in addition to reading the biopsies. Or well, I, I actually did it backwards. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> I was a clinical dermatologist and not a dermatopathologist. Correct. Okay. And I had to learn hair pathology in order to, uh, to assist the patients because the pathologists were not able to do hair exactly. pathology. And so when I started my fellowship in uh, dermatopathology at the AFIP, I already had somewhat of a reputation as a, as a hair pathologist. Okay. I published a few articles. So I came at it backwards, as it were. <laughs> but it worked out well. Yes. <laughs> and I guess I'd like to, to maybe start um, the conversation uh, by asking you, what do you think is the best way to sample hair to, to get, maximize the diagnostic yield? for pathologist, um, do you recommend one, two samples? Um, what do you suggest to get, again, the best tissue sample that you can get for evaluation of the hair? Yeah, well, the, the most important thing is really something that we as uh, dermatopathologists don't have a lot of control over, and that's the exact site to biopsy. Correct. Because clinicians like to find one spot sometimes two, but usually one spot to select, and from that they want to have a definitive answer. And if they pick the wrong area, then we get the wrong information and can't interpret it properly. So where to biopsy depends a little bit on where the, what the clinician feels the diagnosis is. Certainly for a non-cicatricial non alopecia, mm -hmm. like androgenetic alopecia or alopecia areata. Right in the center of the baldest area is okay. the best place. And it's just the opposite for cicatricial alopecia. The best place is away from the bald spot, more toward the edge of the area mm -hmm. of thinning. It's kind of at the junction between normal hair and thinned hair. There, have, there has, has to be um, some hair in the specimen in order to make a definitive diagnosis in most of the forms of inflammatory cicatricial alopecia. Mm -hmm. 
That's very helpful because I find residents ask us that quite often, where exactly to, to get the biopsy. So um, I can pass that along. I do find that I'm not a clinician, but it's useful to know that when we, we are asked that question quite often. Yes. Um, and then I'd also like to ask you, sort of just talking about general, general uh, things about hair, um, tips that you can offer pathologists with regard to different variations in normal hair with regard to maybe ethnicity, age, and so forth, things we need to be aware of um, when we start evaluating uh, the biopsy. Yeah, the, the biggest difference is between racial groups probably mm -hmm. because the number of hairs in a standard four millimeter specimen is going to be different between Caucasians and African Americans and, and Asians. And so what might be normal for a, um, an African American might be interpreted as uh, abnormal or you know, decreased number of hairs in, uh, in a Caucasian. Mm -hmm. so that's probably the major difference. Okay. Now, um, the morphology of hair within the the transversely sectioned specimen or vertically sectioned specimen differs between uh, racial groups and African Americans. The hair shaft tends to be eccentric and the shape of the shaft is more elongated mm -hmm. or, or kidney bean shaped. And that can be important because sometimes we don't have the epidermis in the specimen. Right. So it's hard to see the pigmentation of the, uh, the, the patient's skin. And knowing the, the race is often helpful in figuring out the diagnosis. It's another piece right. of clinical information. Um, now, I like, I'd like to section all my specimens right up to the epidermis. Yes. Um, ex really exhausting the block in most cases. And so usually I can see the epidermis and see the pigmentation also. But those differences in the shapes of hairs, mm -hmm. even deeper down, help to, to um, separate one group from another. Exactly. One other question regarding sampling. What do you recommend as far as the size of a punch biopsy? Four millimeter, six millimeter, and the number of biopsies one should take from the scalp area. Two biopsies, one processed as transverse, the other is horizontal, or just one good four millimeter punch for transverse sectioning? Yes, well, I think certainly a four millimeter punch biopsy is uh, the the best size to take. Mm -hmm. First, most of the literature has been standardized to four millimeters. And then a four millimeter punch actually has almost twice the surface area of a three millimeter punch. So you get twice the information for this trivial um, increase of the size of the scar. So it's, it, it doesn't pay to do anything smaller. Mm -hmm. um, now, if Big, bigger is better than why not a six millimeter? Well, actually, I would prefer to get two four millimeter punch right. biopsies, sampling slightly different sites, mm -hmm. actually, um, rather than have a six millimeter. Now, in terms of getting two, one for vertical and one for horizontal, um, that, that's an approach that is commonly utilized. Mm -hmm. um, I don't find it necessary. Okay. I think just a horizontally sectioned specimen is fine. And in fact, when my laboratory gets two punch biopsies, even if the clinician says, you know, one for vertical, one for mm -hmm. horizontal, I section them both horizontally. Okay. Because then I'm getting the maximum amount of information out of both specimens. Exactly. And kind of segueing from that um, into just looking at transverse sections under the microscope, could you maybe elaborate a little bit on the approach to the transverse biopsies? Um, I know I, in my training, I, look, I didn't look at many transverse biopsies, and I actually learned that as I, um, when I took my job in Ann Arbor, uh, one of my colleagues was, was very good at looking at transverse biopsies, and that's how I learned. And I think it just yields so much more information uh, than the vertical section. So I'd like to know your approach, what you suggest to pathologists, maybe just getting started looking at the transverse uh, section. Yes, well I think a good starting point is what I call the four-step process that mm -hmm. um, is you know, mentioned in this, the second edition of my book, actually. Eleanor Knopp, who's one of the co-authors of that book, has a three-step 
process. It even makes it more abbreviated. Mm -hmm. um, and it's pretty simple. Uh, when one starts looking at the specimen, the first thing to decide on is it a normal number of hairs or not. So that's step number one. Step number two is are the size of the hairs normal or less than normal. Mm -hmm. uh, the third is, is the percentage of large telogen hairs, terminal telogen hairs, increased or not. Mm -hmm. And the fourth thing is, is there significant inflammation at any level? Right. And by significant, I mean um, either intense or destructive or deep inflammation. A little bit of superficial uh, peri-infundibular mm -hmm. inflammation is usually not significant. You know, it's very common and may just represent seborrheic dermatitis. But anyway, with the information from those four steps, you can really uh, distinguish between most forms of alopecia. Okay. Do you do ancillary, when you process these biopsies, do you do PAS, elastic stains routinely, or is that something you just pursue if, you, if need be after you look at the sections on H&E? Yes, well, um, I have my laboratory cut one section um, in sort of the middle of the specimen as they section up and leave that unstained in mm -hmm. case I need it for something else. Okay. Um, it's, it's rare that I use it for something else. Um, I know there are some people who like using elastic stains and find them helpful. Right. But uh, my mentor, Dr. Whiting, and, and I have you know, tried it multiple times and it just hasn't helped us much, so we don't do it. But by all means, if you do elastic stains and mm -hmm. you find them useful and it helps you come to a, a diagnosis, then certainly do them. And you know, as you, so you talked about the four steps in approaching the hair biopsy. Um, I know you've mentioned in your book you like to follow a checklist, which is very helpful, I think. Is that something you routinely do for every biopsy you just have in your mind or even in a synoptic type format, do you include that in the report when you look at certain features um, consistently looking at every biopsy? Well, probably the information I mentioned in those four steps mm -hmm. all gets incorporated in the microscopic okay. description. And then when I go to the, the and, and hopefully a diagnosis leads from that, so there's, that's what's on the diagnostic line. And then in a comment, I explain why the features seen in, the, in that biopsy support a particular diagnosis and what other things might be in the differential diagnosis that may require okay. more clinical information or even an additional biopsy. Okay. For instance, if someone does a biopsy from the crown of the scalp and it shows hair miniaturization mm -hmm. and an increase in the telogen count, that can be all due to androgenetic alopecia. Correct. Or the patient may also have a coincidental telogen effluvium Yes. which is a common scenario. Well, to distinguish that from androgenetic alopecia, it's necessary to have a biopsy from normal appearing scalp to see if the telogen count is increased or not in that area. Yes. So um, uh, that's the sort of information that would be in, the, in a comment. Yes, it's very helpful. Uh, finally, with regard to a dermatopathologist just starting out in practice, what do you recommend? Um, what are your recommendations for gaining expertise in the area and getting more comfortable in interpreting scalp biopsies? Okay, well, everyone is going to have to do the reading. So, however, you want to educate yourself, there are now many more resources out there than there were when I was starting off, for sure. Including so, your new book, well, the edition of your, that, your that's, book? That's one resource, mm -hmm. but there, there are certainly plenty of articles in the peer-reviewed okay. literature that, that uh, talk about the, the subject. But probably the most important thing is to see as many specimens as possible. And uh, in, in some practices, clinicians don't do a lot of biopsies for alopecia, in part because they've did, been disappointed by the results that they get, and they haven't been that, that helpful. Well, um, you know, we can, 
we can fix that by being more expert in our diagnoses. And then when clinicians get back reports that are really helpful in diagnosis and ultimately management of their patients, it's going to encourage them to biopsy more frequently because right. they're more confident they're going to get a useful answer for their patient. And that's what I found in my own practice at Walter Reed. There were very few alopecia biopsies done at the beginning. And by the time I left there for the, the medical school, uh, biopsies were commonplace. So um, I think that's probably the most important thing. To An do. excellent advice. Encourage those clinicians to do more biopsies. I'd like to conclude by asking you if you um, would like to talk about any new trends or entities in the field of hair biology, if it's something you'd like to mention, or yes, well, the uh, it has not been published yet. I hope it makes it all the way through the, the peer review process. But uh, a fellow, uh, a, a former mentee of mine, uh, Dr. Woltman, Wendy Woltman, and I are coming out with an article on multifactorial al alopecia mm. that's being able to bi to diagnose multiple forms of alopecia in the same biopsy to get you know, more than one diagnosis out of a single biopsy, um, assuming the patient has more than one diagnosis. So I think that's, that's kind of a, a, new, uh, a new frontier. And you know, we, we all know that it exists, but in terms of getting it into the, the peer-reviewed literature so that people can begin to get more comfortable about making two or even three diagnoses from a single four millimeter punch biopsy. Excellent. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Sperling, for talking with me today. I know I learned a lot myself from this conversation, and I hope everyone else does as well. All right, thank you, and, and thanks for listening.